I have a very simple question I want you to consider today. Uh, the question is, is it free or does it cost a lot? Is it free or does it cost a lot? The answer to that question is clearly, undoubtedly, unmistakably, plainly, obviously, yes. It's free, and it costs a lot. You and I live in a culture that likes to bifurcate, that's one of my favorite words, bifurcate reality, that is to split it into two, create what we call either-ors. What is most important in life is this or that. What is most important in life is either free or it's costly. But what if it is both at the same time? What if what matters in life is completely free but will be the costliest thing you'll ever experience? That is the truth into which Paul in Galatians is inviting us. Let's start with the freedom side, which I have to tell you is my favorite side. And by the way, this is the side you need to get first. Before you go on to that second side, make sure you get this first side. Paul was dealing with some teachers and leaders who wanted to split life into either ors. Some enemies in thought who were claiming that his emphasis on freedom was dangerous, that it would lead people astray, would sacrifice the holy scriptures. In some ways, these folks were saying, Paul is not very biblical. Because you see, the Bible speaks clearly about the law, about the significance of men, sorry women, you weren't included in those days, of men being circumcised. It's quite clear, and that means, the scriptures are quite clear, and that means that these Gentiles, these non-Jews who are being attracted to the Christian faith must be circumcised before they become a part of the club. And they must follow some of the other Jewish regulations some of these teachers believed, including not eating ham sandwiches, not eating certain kinds of foods. Well, for the leaders and the teachers who were talking in this way, there were some gottas and some absolute shoulds for the Christian faith. You gotta become Jewish before you become Christian. And that teaching just ticked Paul off. For freedom, Christ has set us free, he proclaimly states. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Galatians, he's saying to these readers, don't give in to these kinds of teachers. Don't give in to their tyranny. In his view, he has worked entirely too hard to proclaim the freedom that is in Christ for the community at Galatia to give in to the crabby, fundamentalist, rigid teachers. What matters in life is free, he's saying. There are no gottas. There are no shoulds. Life is not dependent upon you going through all the right hoops, doing all the right things, proving yourself, justifying yourself, accomplishing more than other people, achieving more than other people. What matters in life most of all is free, sheer gift in Christ, Paul would have us know. We have been set free from all the gadas. And Paul doesn't seem to care that if you can quote Bible passages to prove otherwise. Paul is no biblical fundamentalist. He reads the Bible through the lens of freedom. We Lutherans would say that he reads it through the lens of the gospel. The gospel, the good news for him, is that we are justified, not by what we do, but justified by grace, which we receive through faith, our trust. Paul Tillich, favorite thinker of mine puts it this way, we are accepted, accepted by that which is greater than us, and the call is to accept the fact that we are accepted, and that's what Paul Tillich says is faith. Much religion, by the way, is just the opposite of that kind of teaching. Throughout history, religion too often has been a hoop-jumping-through scheme. It has been a collection of shoulds and gottas. Often, when people think of religion, 
They think of what you shouldn't do. When some people confront me, a religious professional, they do with a sense, they do so with a sense of what hoops they haven't jumped through, what naughty things they have done recently, the fact that they haven't been to church, as they say, for months or years. And I, and I notice, I, even around here it happens, I enter into a room and somebody's like, you better start behaving, the pastor is here. Religion is defined as behavior and a certain kind of behavior. And some people, probably even admirers, avoid me just so they don't have to deal with someone who represents a giant no to them. I got to tell you, this is just being me, me being frank here. This is the hardest thing about being a pastor. People always say, man, it must be terribly hard to deal with funerals. Uh, funerals are actually can be wonderful experiences. But dealing with the fact that people think you are the moral police is a horrible thing. William Loder, in a profound commentary on our Galatians passage for today, reflecting the call to avoid either or, says uh, religion can damage people. And, he says, religion can make them well. Now, before I do a deal with the latter, I, I want to deal with the former again, in case you haven't gotten it. A lot of people have been damaged by religion. A lot of people unhealthy religion, religion that is simply about demand. Such religion can turn people into crabby, angry, judgmental folks who know what's best for everybody but themselves. This kind of religion, I have to say, has been a contributing factor to the poor politics of our time, to a spirit of exclusion, to a resistance toward the insights of science and psychology. Bad religion can damage people and cultures. And it was bad religion that Paul was struggling against. Hear this before I get out of this. Hear this and hear this clearly. In Jesus Christ, you are free. In him there are no hoops you've got to jump through. In him love is not earned, but love is given. In him your worth as a human being is not achieved, but is received as a gift. And this is, this is the message of religion that can make you well. You are free. Okay, that's the first part of the both and. Uh, my favorite part, in case you didn't notice, I get all worked up about that part because that's just the part that drives my whole life. Uh, but I, I don't want you to move on to that, this second part, by the way, until you get the first part. Or, I, I guess I would put it better this way, until you allow yourself to be grasped by that first part. You may not get it fully. You may spend the rest of your life trying to figure it out. But just allow it to grasp you a little bit. When that message, though, starts to sink in, when, when the love and the grace that are yours start to, to, to immerse you, penetrate your skin and your heart and your soul, then be prepared to hear this. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only uh, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. Okay, here's Paul responding to those who might misunderstand him. And, and there are folks who misunderstand Lutheranism. We talk about grace all the time. Grace, grace, grace. And, and some folks say, oh, I guess that means I can do whatever I darn well please whenever I darn well want, right? Well, Paul is assuring his audience that that is not his message. His approach to the faith is not one in which everything and anything goes. And that can be a problem with an emphasis on freedom. If I'm free, then I can do whatever I darn well please whenever I want to. And this is one of the great problems of the American experiment, by the way, and we've been experiencing this greatly lately. We have been people of great freedom, and I think to our credit, by the way, 
This has been one of our great gifts to the whole world. But sometimes that emphasis on freedom has been an opportunity for great self-indulgence. And the consequence hasn't always been good. Paul says, if you bite, I like this line, if you bite and devour one another, something that occurs when freedom is a matter of license, doing whatever you want, then you better watch out. Or, he says, you will be consumed by one another. Freedom that is not shaped by love can get ugly really quickly. Love, Paul says, is our calling. Love sums up the whole law. Love is what real freedom leads to. If you've been loved, you love. If you've been set free, you don't enslave people by your self-centered actions and words. You live in a way that frees them up and frees you up to love. Let's face it. Sometimes what people call freedom is really not freedom at all. And those who live with addictions and have dealt with them will tell you this. But you know how it goes. I'm free, and so you better not tell me what to do. And pretty soon, what they thought was freedom becomes a different form of enslavement. And it's called an enslavement to the self. If the ancient and profound story of Adam and Eve in the garden tells us anything, and frankly, I think it tells us a a lot, it lets us in on the truth that true freedom is shaped by limits. True freedom is shaped by boundaries. If you know the story, you know it in this, it says, uh, you can eat of any tree in in uh, in the garden. Any tree? Any tree, there's great permission, by the way. Again, people approach that that story as if it's all about forbiddenness. But it is, there's any tree you can eat from. But there's one you can't. And what is that one? The one of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is when you don't be human like you're supposed to be. There is great permission granted in life But that permission is also shaped by limit. And for Paul, the limit is love. He says, live by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. And by the way, when you hear that, you think of flesh. And I did when I was growing up. It sounded like it was talking about my body. And then I really thought my body was an awful thing. That's not what Paul is saying. Your body is a good thing, a very good thing. The flesh is our tendency to view life through the lens of self-preoccupation and self-centeredness. The flesh is our desire to do simply what feeds our pleasure, our anger, our need for self-justification. You know, sometimes I would just like to speak my mind to people I don't like. And sometimes I just want to tell them what it, what, what it, how it should be. To live by the Spirit and not by the flesh is to allow love to limit what the flesh wants. So sometimes i got to shut my mouth. Is it free? Yes. Does it cost a whole lot? You betcha. To be led by the Spirit, as Paul puts it, or to follow Jesus, as our gospel lesson indicates, is to engage in something that is phenomenally costly. Grace and love are not permission to do whatever you want. Grace and love invites you into costly discipleship that is shaped by, not rules, but by love and grace. Did you hear Jesus' words today? wild words, to a person who responded to his invitation to follow him with, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. He said, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. In other words, to follow him means letting go. Letting go sometimes of the family that keeps you back. Letting go of the past. And I know for sure it means letting go of yourself. Now, the theme for today, letting go sometimes, 
is great, by the way, because I think it was impacted by Elisha's ability in our first reading to return to his family before he followed Elijah. Jesus didn't allow for that, by the way. Letting go, obviously, is very complicated stuff. But still, you will note that after Elisha returns to his family, he burns the equipment that is used for his job in the fire that produces the meat for the party that is being thrown for him. That means for him to make a living, the way he makes a living is being done away with. It's being done away with because he's got a new responsibility. He is letting go as he follows his teacher and mentor, Elijah. To follow Jesus, to be led by the Spirit, is to let go of yourself. What matters most in life, Luke calls it the kingdom, costs a lot. But note what comes and what happens when we don't let go. And Paul provides a long list. Fornication, idolatry, enmities, angers, quarrels, dissensions. It's, it's not, free, not pretty. It's not pretty when freedom is not shaped by love. But when it is, it's beautiful. And this is what we get, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness. Even as I say those words, my whole self starts to relax. That's what begins to happen when we let ourselves go. In other words... When freedom is shaped by love, community is built and nurtured. Unlimited, absolute freedom, doing whatever you dog walk on well please, is a recipe for death. And we are living in a culture that knows that too well right now. But allowing your freedom to be shaped by love, self-giving love, wow, that is a recipe for life, true life. Life lived in shalom, peace, together. Amen.